Hello everyone. Welcome to Drop Stitches Podcast episode 17. Today is August 20th and it is the evening here in New Hampshire. And uh, thank you for joining me. I'm your host, Sapphire Child, as known on Ravelry. And on Instagram, you can find me as Julia.redman, R-E-D-M-A-N. Drop by and say hello. So I'm going to try to keep today's episode a bit short, but I did want to record um, because I'm, you know, falling into that habit of recording only once a month again, and I know that that makes some of you maybe wonder whether I'm going to record again. <laughs> so I thought I'd try to get something out. But um, anyway, the point is that in less than an hour, the next episode of Game of Thrones comes out, and I want to actually watch it as it's going on, because if I don't, I'm going to get frantic text messages from my friend Lara as she tells me what's going on and asks me if I can stand it. <laughs> Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, so consequently, um, I know I was going to talk about um, my new newly acquired antique spinning, well, vintage spinning wheel today, but I'm not going to today. I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of some FOs and a couple of works in progress, but maybe not all of them. Um, so why don't we start off with this thing behind me, which you've seen a few times before. It has been um, working its way, working its way up to done for quite some time. This is the Robin by Lethal Knits shawl. And you can do it as a two or a three color shawl. And as you can see, I did this as a three color. And this was, as I've said before, leftover yarns from a baby blanket. Um, actually, these two colors, uh, the lighter lighter blue, green, and the white, were leftovers. And I had bought all three skeins for it, but ended up only using those two. So I had plenty of this dark blue. Um, and since, well, my camera's never great, but the colors are accurate, but they're a little bit lighter than what it looks like in the picture on my screen anyway. Um, I had planned on this being bigger, um, but I started running out of white, so I had to cut it short. Um, and I think that's okay, because after it's washed and blocked, that's still plenty, plenty big, as you can see. You know, it's, it's a good um, six or so feet wide and easily makes a scarf shawl kind of thing and would be quite lovely. Um, and this is Barocco, pardon me, grab my phone to double check. Uh, I think it's Barocco Vintage. Barocco Vintage DK, yes. Okay, and um, which is a machine washable yarn and, and, and quite soft to the touch. Nice yarn. Anyway, so that's finally finished. And off the needles and uh, since that's off the needles it's no longer the thing that travels in my in my bag with me to work every day so I have another effa that's been circling around forever which I didn't bring in to show you but um, um, I think I've posted pictures of it on Instagram a few times if you watch that if you watch my Instagram feed um, so I can also show you this other finished object. Let me move this over a little bit and I'm gonna move the camera as well. So um, this fun little object was from a, um, a, a freebie, a giveaway that I got on Instagram from the Wooly Thistle with this nice bag came with it. Isn't that fun? And um, I got six skeins of this yarn, which is uh, Hole and Sons, and it's it's Dorset Pole wool. There were six skeins of it, and they're 50 gram skeins. Um, and it's like I don't remember if it's a if they're calling it a worsted or a DK, but it's a you know it's a it's a trunk, kind of a chunky yarn for a shawl, but it works out well. And it also came with the pattern. So, um, and you can see that's Tales from the Isle of Purbeck uh, by Annie Claire. 
and um, a very nice pattern. There's the, the pattern pick on the back. Very nice pattern, very easy to follow. Um, and it was, you know, made for this yarn specifically. I think the only thing I did differently was that I did a different bind off. Um, it calls for an Icelandic bind off, and I just did um, a sort of standard stretchy bind off. And um, it used all the yarn except for one little bit. So it was just a perfect amount left over. Um, and um, it's a lovely yarn. So the, the Wooly Thistle specializes, as it says there, in British yarn. So it's all imported from the British Isles, various locations. And I think she is now the um, official distributor for blacker yarns in the U.S., which is a, which is a, a nice distinction to have, I think. Um, so, and there's her website too, thewoollythistle.com. And the really fun thing about this is, is that she's here in New Hampshire as well. And she also does the uh, New Hampshire Knits podcast. And that's, that's her there. Um, so, you know, uh, that was kind of a fun thing to win a prize from someone else here in New Hampshire. Uh, and I just... Thanks a lot, the Wooly Thistle. I really enjoyed this. I love Dorset wools. Um, well, I love down wools, rather, and Dorset is a down wool. Um, so it was really exciting for me to win it, just because one of my favorite things. Of course, all the things are my favorite things, so it's somewhat irrelevant, but <laughs> not really. I, I do really like... Um, down walls just give you a better look at it it's fairly large as you might imagine for being 200 sorry 300 grams of wool essentially and it's a very easy knit it has it actually the pattern rows are only up every fourth row um and the others are, are straight knit or purl, so it's it's really easy to breeze through it, and then plus it's it's kind of chunky wool. So um, I got through the first few first three skeins in like three evenings or something like this, and then um, didn't work on it for a week or two, and then finished it lickety split. And and again, a lot of fun. Um, this is not the softest Dorset. Um, it's not really itchy either, it's just woolly feeling, but, um, consequently I did condition this, um, and I was hoping that the conditioner would also help, uh, allow it to be blocked, because sometimes down wools won't have it. <laughs> you try to block them and they're just like, no, no, I have my own plants. <laughs> um, but this looks like it's blocked out well. It hasn't been off the needle or the uh, pins for that long, so we'll see if it actually holds that block. Um, that said, even some things that you would expect to hold a block don't always hold a block. So this thing that I'm wearing here is um, it's the Iron Maiden pattern. I, I did this a long time ago. Hang on a second, let me give you the, sorry. I keep pulling up the wrong page. Iron Maiden by Marissa Hernandez. It is, oh, blowing that out. There we go. And that is a, a paid pattern on Ravelry. And this is in um, Breathless. And, and notice there's no points on the bottom. When I blocked this, that it had points on the bottom, and um, now it doesn't. It, you know, after it had been worn for a while, um, they just they just kind of gave up. Uh, I don't know why it just did that. Um, I'm going to show you a picture. That's when it was first complete. Ah, you get the idea. You can kind of see the points on it. Um, and, uh, so at one time it did have points on it, 
And uh, is there, oh yeah, here's another fun picture I can share with you. Can you see that? Uh, sorry, there we go. Down in the lower corner there. I wish you could see him a little better. That's my cat, Duncan. Um, he came around while we were taking the pictures and was sass talking me. <laughs> um, uh, Duncan isn't with us anymore, but um, he was a uh, um, a Norwegian forest cat. Great big grouchy creature. He was fantastic. I loved him. Um, anyway, so I don't know why this didn't hold the points on the bottom. Uh, perhaps the bind off was a little too snug. It's hard to say. The rest of the shawl has has held out in terms of you can see that the the um, the uh, the lace holes are still well open, so it didn't collapse or anything. It's just that edge. Uh, let's see. All right, more finished objects. So I have some hand spun. What do you think of that? It's a very chunky, uh, bulky, super bulky kind of yarn. And it was spun as a double marl. And it, as you can, you might be able to kind of imagine how I did that. But basically, I took two different rovings, obviously one white and one purple, and drafted them together and then spun them together. And so as you're spinning, sometimes, you know, you're moving across the, the it's not, I don't really spin across the web, but you know, it's that kind of a concept. And as, as you're spinning, sometimes you're pulling more purple or more white. And so you get some kind of a heathered mixed tweety thing going on. And um, I did that for both strands and then two plied it. And it puffed up wonderfully. The uh, white, is uh, Tunis that I got from Solitude Wool, and it it, um, it it had a lot of spinning oil in it when I got it, so it actually didn't look bright white, but after washing in hot water with some dish soap, that spinning oil came right out, and now it's bright white, and it puffed up nicely. And um, the purple I got from this guy that used to sometimes come to Maryland Sheep and Wool, um, and uh, he has a mill in um, Maine, but he doesn't do custom work anymore. And I think I think he still goes to um, the New York show. And he sells yarns and he sells some roving. Um, so this is whatever his proprietary local wool blend is. I don't really know what's in it. Um, I didn't come with a tag and I don't remember but as I recall, it's all wool. Anyway, it's all mixed in there now. Um, and uh, I got, I just took what he had left that day of the purple. It was a pretty color. And, uh, and so it wasn't like a normal size lot. It was just a whatever. So what I end up with in the end is about a 6.6 .6 ounce skein. And I've got about 160 yards on it, and um, we can just call that all wool, of unknown origins. All right, let's set that aside. No, nope. okay. And then I have another hand spun skein, and it's Dorset. <laughs> um, this is Dorset that Lara. My friend Laura, also known as Laura Smoot Designs, um, sent me last year, and I dyed up a bunch of it. And then I had some leftover dyes in various colors, and I just kind of dumped it all over a small amount of wool. And it comes out to be kind of a khaki... Hmm. What's... yeah, well... It's kind of like a neutral, not green, not brown color, which makes it sound hideous, but it, it's actually rather nice looking um, and would probably be fantastic for a hat. Um, there might be enough of it. It's 2.6 ounces and 112 yards. 
I might be able to get a hat out of that if it's not very big. Um, if not, I can probably find some bits of something else to do like a two color job with. Um, oh, uh, this was spun on my Hanson Crafts wheel and that one, the purple, was uh, the singles were done on the Clems and plied on the Hanson because that's pretty much what I always do, ply on the Hanson. So, if we move on to some works in progress, I'll start with the one I'm going to rip out. <laughs> This is some hand spun, and if you used to watch when I recorded with my sister a couple of years ago, I think I showed this skein. It's Baby Doll Southdown from a you named Libby from a Friends Farm. And uh, Libby's kind of an unusual character in that her, her wool is a bit on the more relaxed side for Baby Doll Southdown, and it's still fine. And so it was consequently and and I had this roving done and it was just just Libby so consequently it was really easy to spin it fine and very even um, it's not perfect perfectly even but it's it's close enough you'll never notice any difference really when it's finished not significantly anyway and this is natural color this is her natural color she's kind of black in color I think this this might have been her second year fleece, so she was still black, um, or nearly black. And then you know the tips are kind of heathered, uh, sun bleached brown, and so the overall look is a deep, special dark bar chocolate brown. It's a wonderful color, and um, I still have more of this roving if anybody wants some. As a general rule, I have tons of baby doll roving. Just let me know if you need some. <laughs> anyway, um, this is uh, when I have one of my nice little sweary stitch markers from Slap Your Llama. <laughs> um, they say different obnoxious things on one side or the other. Uh, I forgot that was on there. Sorry if you're sensitive. I'm kind of not, so sorry. <laughs> Um, this is the peppernut pattern, and if I hold it at an angle, you can see that there's there's a knit pearl texture action on it, but I have to hold it at an angle for you to see it, otherwise it just completely disappears. It's that way in person, too. You can barely see the texture. That's why I'm going to rip it out. It just gets lost because of the fact that I think it's, I think it's just because the, the yarn is so dark. So... I need to think of something else to do with this yarn. I had been, this pattern has been sitting in my queue since it came out, which was like 2013. And um, at least for the last couple of years, or well, yeah, probably since I spun this yarn, I've known I wanted to make that pattern with it. And now that I'm starting to make that pattern with it, I don't like it. So I need to find something else to do with this yarn. I have about 600 and 20 or 630 yards of this stuff and it's about a fingering weight maybe a light fingering um yeah i spent i spent about an hour looking through my ravelry queue which again if you follow me on instagram you might have noticed some of my posts in which i admitted to the size of my Ravelry queue, so it's not like there's no shortage of things that I'd like to make or things that are, or even things not in my queue that are floating around in my head that I would just like to make off the top of my head. <laughs> and yeah, I've got no ideas. I, I have a perennial problem in which I have to pick the perfect thing <laughs> for a lot of my yarns. It's not, I can't just, oh, I want to make that. Here's some yarn. Let's make it happen. No, I have problems with that. Sometimes I can do it. Usually I can't. It's got to be the thing. Sooner or later, maybe I'll let go of that. <laughs> Probably not. It is what it is. 
but I held on to it long enough so that you could see it. You're welcome. All right. Something else that might get ripped out. Because <laughs> that's how I roll today, apparently. Um, so in my knit spin farm bag, how awesome. Very. Who doesn't like lime green and red chickens? Or were they orange? Something like that. Anyway. So, prior to Tour de Fleece, I was working on a sweater. I think I showed it to you. Well, I got the body done. And I went back and I picked up stitches and was doing this. It's a big giant mess right now, but was doing the neck and then I tried it on again and keep in mind when I'm doing any sweater in the round I will try it on multiple times to make sure that I like the way the shaping is going I like the way the shaping is landing that the length seems like it's appropriate right everything seemed fine I put the, the neck on it and that changed the way it sat so normally, I don't knit that many sweaters from the top down. This is top down one. And um, maybe that's my problem. But it sat a lot lower before I put a neck on it. And now that I have ne neck ribbing on it, the last time I had it on, in this state, which was actually a few weeks ago, it's been in timeout, um, it was too short, or at least it seemed like it was too short, and it also seemed like it was too tight. I was generally not happy with it, and maybe I was just in a bitchy mood that day. That's entirely possible, but so it is. Um, you know, it's a nice looking thing, but uh, you know, and maybe it'll be different once I get it off the needles. So that's the other thing. I'm not sure if if it's putting the neck ribbing on it and it's it's drawing in what you know the neck it's a it's a low neck so it comes down you know near my goods there and um and uh, maybe putting the neck ribbing on it you know tightened that up a little bit and so now instead of it like kind of dragging down and allowing itself to be pulled down lower it now won't do it and i and maybe it's the ribbing maybe it's the fact that a needle's still in it I haven't decided. I'm mad at it. Um, it is, uh, so the pattern, it, you know, it's a perfectly good pattern. Um, I'm just not happy with what I've done with it. Let me just throw that out there. The The pattern is Knit Me Baby One More Time by Mary Arinella. And originally I had obje an objective to finish this while she was doing the uh, sweater along cow. Uh, but of course I didn't because reality is it is often mean. And um, and then Tour de Fleece happened, and so I didn't really work on it a lot. Um, I did carry it around with me a bit um, to work and stuff, and so I would do a few rows here and a few rows there. Um, and then I worked on it kind of after Tour de Fleece was open, uh, over, and then I got mad, and I haven't touched it. So I don't know what to do with it. The yarn, oh, the yarn is um, um, Marigold Jen's, I don't know what she calls the base, but it's it's a it's a nylon um, merino nylon sock base. Two skeins. Uh, I don't know. I guess I should at least try it on again and see if I'm still mad at it. All right, let's put that away. And uh, at least for me, there's certainly enough yarn out of these two skeins to finish the sweater. Um, with at least three quarter length sleeves, I think. Maybe with a little bit, maybe even full length sleeves. Um, and it's also possible that I could re-knit the entire thing to a size that would actually fit better and I would still have enough yarn. We'll see.
Oh, that's going to be in the way. Let me put this down. All right. I have one last thing to show you. And I need you to hold on to your lunch a little bit because I'm going to move the computer so you can see it. Um, ignore my mess. All right. On my rigid heddle loom here, I have the beginnings of a collapse weave. This is warped with singles yarns, all of its singles, and then I'm using the same singles as weft. I have two different kinds of things going on here um, in the warp. The blue, well, most of it, the blue, black, everything except the white, is this same thing here, which is um, some hobbly toy, excuse me, hobbly hoy batlings that I spun on uh, the Kromsky Minstrel. Um, relatively fine. Ish. And, uh, and you can see they're live, live singles. They haven't been blocked or anything like that. Um, I don't do that for a few reasons. Number one, I want the singles to collapse um, when it's washed for the first time. And I'll explain that a little bit in a minute. And number two, um, because I want that to happen, I don't want to block the singles in any way and take out any of that energy. And I could probably still wash them and get away with, with washing it without really releasing any of that energy. But uh, that would actually take more time. If I do it this way, I can warp the loom directly from the bobbin that they were spun onto. And then also, you know, um, load my shuttle directly from that bobbin also. So what is collapse weave? So you can see that I'm, um, I don't know if you can see this very well, probably not, but you can kind of see my hand through that, right? So these, um, let me move you a little bit closer. There we go. Is that better? Sort of. So I'm weaving this a bit open. And, um, and that's specifically to leave some space for the singles to move a bit um, once they're washed. And again, since they do have this energy, well, yeah, so you can, they're kind of a pain because of that. Um, but, you know, all spun singles, if you don't spin, you know, you're, it's just a matter of adding twist. And then when you ply, you know, that's, that's plying, that's spinning it in the other direction. And just the yarn, the fiber itself trying to move back to its original shape and then pushing against the other fibers, that's what makes a balanced yarn that sticks together. Just that friction. It's that simple. Well, when you take a singles yarn with that energy still in it and you weave it, you can even, can you even see, this is, this is even kind of wiggly already. And that's because the singles are trying to do their thing while I'm, while I'm weaving. Now, while it's under tension, there's only so far they can go. And once you take it off the loom and wash it, Again, those fibers are going to bloom. They're going to try to move. They're going to try to retain their or return to their original shape, um, which is going to cause them to try to twist back on themselves. And but they're in a position here where they're stuck against each other, right? So there's only so far they can go. The consequence of all this is is that once it's washed and it and this energy tries to express itself, the entire piece of fabric is going to draw in. And, um, and it will become a bit three-dimensional. I've done this before. I think in, in uh, a couple episodes ago, I might have shown you one that I did that was made with um, some classy squid fiber. Um, and the result is a, a very live, kind of stretchy... Um, uh, I'm not sure how to describe it, but it's, it's, it is certainly an energetic fabric. Yes, I guess that's the best way I can say it, you know. And on this one, 
I'm leaving in some places some some warp floats too. I've not done that before with singles. It'll be interesting to see how they behave. There's some floats there. There's floats there. I'm only doing with this white fiber, which is which is Cormo, by the way. Um, left over from from uh, some tour de fleece action. Uh, the blue ones have been spun for a while. Now, when I've done this before, um, usually just leaving them sit on the bobbin for a while. Those of you that spin know that if you leave single spit on, sit on the bobbin for a couple of months, they usually just kind of go to sleep almost, and they'll stay in that position. But for whatever reason, this blue stuff is coming off the bobbin, and it's just still as energetic as the day it was spun. Uh, well, almost. I mean, maybe not completely, but it's still got a lot of energy in it. So this may actually draw in a lot more than I think it will. <laughs> so we'll have to see what it does. Um, so anyway, because of that draw-in factor, although what you're seeing now is, is about 7 inches wide, it's not going to be 7 inches wide by the time it's washed. So that was just started. I warped that yesterday and um, woke a little bit on it today. And uh, maybe by the next time I see you, it'll be finished and washed and you'll get to see what it looks like. But um, I did want you to have, part of the reason I wanted to record today was to give you a chance to see it on the loom. Because um, it'll look a lot different when it's done. All right. And it looks like my computer is trying to freeze a little bit. I've got a lot of stuff on my hard drive. I should probably clean it up. So, with that, I think we should call it quits for today. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode, and I hope you'll stop by in the Ravelry group at Dropped Stitches Podcast uh, Ravelry group and say hello, or stop by on Instagram and say hello. Uh, introduce yourself. I do enjoy it. By the way, a couple of people have contacted me on Instagram to, you know, say that they've enjoyed the podcasts and that they re they relate with various things that I've said or shared, and I do really appreciate that. Um, just throwing that out there, even though, uh, you know, whatever whatever you might think about how you know as soon sometimes it's kind of hard to, to to put yourself out there and say things to people who you watch online and so on but i just want to let you know that we do appreciate those kinds of things it's nice to get feedback it's nice to know that someone besides your friends is listening <laughs> um uh, you know, I also appreciate that my friends are watching, but it's a little easier for you to watch and listen to me ramble on than it is for complete strangers to <laughs> to come by and say, oh, this is kind of cool. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for having the courage to reach out and say that you appreciate uh, the time that I put into this and the content. I, I enjoy that, hearing that. So... Again, thanks for stopping by. Have a great evening.